Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our program about the alarming rise in hate crimes. It is sponsored by Salt Lake City and our city library, and it was planned by our Jewish Federation's Community Partners Against Hate. I'm Jay Jacobson, an infectious disease physician, epidemiologist, and a Jew. So I read hate crimes reports, and I multiply the numbers to account for underreporting. The FBI just announced that in 2019 in America, over 7,000 hate crimes were reported, almost 1,000 directed at Jews. The rates are rising, the crimes are more violent. This is an epidemic. The horrific killing of 11 Jews praying in 2018 was soon exceeded by the slaughter of 23 Hispanics simply shopping in El Paso. We mourn together and we must respond together. Our partners who are leaders of the repeatedly targeted African American, Hispanic, LGBTQ, and Muslim communities joined with concerned others in 2019 to pass Utah's long-awaited hate crimes law. Let's now meet four people who were a part of that historic event. They are Seth Brisk of the Anti-Defamation League, Patrice Arendt and Sandra Hollins, Jewish and African American Utah representatives, and Derek Kitchen, a Utah Senator and member of our LGBTQ community. I'm Seth Brisk, Central Pacific Regional Director for the ADL and a proud representative of our agency. The agency that innovated the concept of hate crime law, drafted the model statute in effect in 45 states in the District of Columbia, and repeatedly defended the constitutionality of hate crime laws. As someone who lives outside of Utah, but works for and represents communities in Utah, I offer this observation. We are about to witness Utahns demonstrating remarkable leadership, providing inspiration and hope throughout the Beehive State and across our country. From Georgia to Indiana and beyond, communities have renewed courage that they can join you and score a victory for justice and freedom over crimes motivated by hatred and bigotry. It is the strength of our country and state that expression of belief is protected, no matter how offensive it may be to others. But until today, it has been a failing of our state to allow people to commit a crime based on a hateful belief without serious consequences. Today, that ends. Today, we come together as a state to hold accountable those who commit crimes in the name of hate. Today, we stand together to ensure the safety and welfare of all our neighbors. I am encouraged by what we have accomplished in 2019 session. But this does not mean that we have prevented all future hateful challenges and injustices from occurring. This, but this law is a tool that we now have to fight against those injustices. We must continue to stay vigilant and commit to the well-being of all of our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Just a couple weeks ago, a few of my dear friends in the community that I am charged with representing were attacked on the street of Salt Lake City. The thing with hate crimes is that there are two victims the person that was harmed, but the community that they represent. And it's the community at large that we're also trying to protect here. Two epidemics. A vaccine will help control the COVID epidemic but we don't have a vaccine that prevents hateful acts. Instead, we must understand hate crimes in order to report, respond, and prevent them. We must also address the climate of bias and bile 
that drive some to commit crimes and others to tolerate them. Our state has declared that it abhors hate crimes and will punish them. We would rather prevent them. We've asked our mayor and our school board to implement policies and programs to do just that, to change the climate. Our mayor has emphasized and exemplified civility, respect, and equity in her campaign and in her administration. Battling two epidemics, she has shown real concern for those disproportionately threatened by one, the other, or too often by both. These community conversations, such as the one this evening, show us how we can talk, listen, learn, and work together to ensure that Salt Lake City is no place for hate. It is a privilege to introduce Salt Lake City's Mayor, Aaron Mendenhall. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. Good evening. I am Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, and we are happy to have you joining us tonight for Community Conversations, Rising Hate Crimes in the U.S., Awareness and Understanding. With the release just mentioned earlier this week of the annual FBI report on hate crimes in the United States, this conversation comes at a critical moment for our nation, which just last year reached its highest level of hate crimes in more than a decade. Hate crimes are one of the most atrocious forms of violence that exist. They're crimes against a person or persons rooted in hate. An incorrect perception or a stereotype the perpetrator has about something the victim sees to embody. The intent of a hate crime is to invoke fear, not only for the victim, but for the community to which they belong. We live in a time when most Americans feel a deep division in this nation, and Utah and Salt Lake City are not immune to this fracturing. This panel is a vital component in the work we need to do to better shine a light on an ugly and deep-rooted darkness that exists in America and so that we may better continue the work of fixing our systems of inequality. Like most who live in Utah uh, know this, people outside the state are sometimes surprised to hear that Salt Lake City has incredible diversity. It's what I believe makes our capital city so very special. Over one third of Salt Lake City's population identifies as non-white with one in five identifying as Hispanic or Latino. Our Asian population is the next largest and it has been increasing throughout the decade. Just last year, over 90 languages were spoken in the Salt Lake City School District. Salt Lake City also has one of the nation's highest concentrations of LGBTQ people. In 2015, our city had the seventh highest per capita rate of people identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, according to a Gallup poll of the nation's top 50 metropolitan areas. These beautiful, resilient, and ever-growing communities are what make conversations like the one we're having tonight and policy work at the city level and at the state level so crucial. And it's why Salt Lake City must be a leader in the work to prevent hate crimes. At a local level, our focus is on creating a foundation of equity and understanding in our city. When I took office in January earlier this year, some of the first conversations I had were related to ensuring that our city and our law enforcement policies were in line with the latest hate crime statutes. And also I began working with the United Jewish Federation of Utah's Community Partners Against Hate, as well as our own Salt Lake City Human Rights Commission. I am grateful for you as leaders in this work. Our commitment is to never stop working against bias, hate, and racism in our community. In Salt Lake City, there is no place for hate. Thank you to the United Jewish Federation of Utah and their community partners against hate. Tonight's conversations would not be possible without your expertise, your passion, and your partnership. And to our panelists and our moderator, welcome to all of you. And thank you for your time, your wisdom, and your insights you're about to share. Thank you.
It's now my second privilege to introduce the moderator of our panel tonight, um, Alejandro Butel. Jay, thank you very much. Mayor Mendenhall, thank you very much. And hello everyone, and thank you all for attending tonight's event. Tonight, we have quite a lineup of speakers for an important discussion that Jay and Mayor Mendenhall had just mentioned earlier. And the timing and symbolism of our conversation can't be overstated. This discussion, while certainly not new, does have an added sense of urgency and importance, coming immediately after a heated and nail-biter of an election and some stark statistics from the latest FBI hate crimes report. The run-up to the vote, including the COVID public health crisis and its associated uh, economic downturn and the nationwide anti-racism protests sparked by the recent killings of individuals such as Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and sadly many others, have elevated the visibility of questions and conversations around race, justice, inclusion, and belonging. Tonight's event is only going to be scratching one of those conversations, that is hate and hate crimes. And there's so much that could be discussed this evening, but we have only so much time to do it in. And yet, and yet with that said, we do have a fantastic panel of speakers with us. Before calling up our first panelist and getting into the substance of things, just a quick word about tonight's format. I'll briefly introduce each panelist. Their detailed bios can be read in the event uh, flyers. And I'll ask them a few prompt questions to tee up their remarks. They will each have 10 minutes to respond to the questions, as well as provide other key points they wish to make within that time frame. To reiterate to our panelists, I will be moderating the time in the panelist chat, providing five minute, two minute, and 30 second cues. As our panelists are speaking, please feel free to submit any questions or comments in the Q&A function of the webinar. After the panelists have concluded their introductory remarks, we will enter into the Q&A portion of the event, where I will read from the uh, read questions and comments from the items submitted there. And just finally, there's going to be a survey going around in the chat function of the webinar and on Facebook. Please take a moment when you have an opportunity to also fill it out. Your feedback means a lot to us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Leisha Brooks of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Leisha, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alejandro. I'd like to thank the mayor also and I thank the City Library and the Jewish Federation for supporting and sponsoring this very important event. Fantastic. Well, Leisha, you know, SPLC has been one of the nation's foremost civil rights event, uh, organizations for nearly 40 years. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell folks that I had the benefit of working at SPLC from 2017 to 2019 as a senior research analyst. Uh, and during that time, a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine at SPLC, Swathi Shanmugasundaram, had wrote an excellent backgrounder called Hate Crimes Explained. And I have to you know, say, there's been a lot of excellent research that's been done uh, to give us greater insights into hate crimes. The latest FBI statistics offers a very stark example. Um, where I'm studying right now uh, at UMass Lowell, Dr. Arye Perliger and some of my colleagues at the University of Maryland have also done some great things. And with that, I would also include this SPLC backgrounder. And in line with tonight's event to raise awareness and understanding about hate and hate crimes, can you help us with the following here? And I apologize if it comes off as maybe, you know, just bombarding you with a few questions, but I think the first and most basic one, what exactly is a hate crime? And how does that differ from hate speech and hate incidents? Who are some of the perpetrators of these heinous events? What are some of the most important statistical trends? And who are the victims? We can't forget about them either. And how are they being impacted, especially amid America's most recent reckoning with anti-Black racism and the nationwide protests that we've been seeing? Leisha? Thank you for those questions. And, and actually, they're excellent questions because we, we do find ourselves talking about hate crimes and I'm not sure that everyone understands exactly what they are. So let me start there. And I would like to also give a little background on the Hate Crime Statistics Act of 1990 for which 
this report was referenced a couple of times. But let me say that a hate crime is an enhancement on a crime. So an actual crime has to have occurred for a hate crime to be added to that. For instance, murder. Someone committed the act of murder. Law enforcement must prove that the primary motivation in whole or in part was based on bias. And that bias must be based on certain identity characteristics. So it's important to remember that a crime, an actual crime on the books has to take place. It has to be proven that the primary motivation for the commission of that crime was bias or hate. Now a hate incident, it doesn't rise to the level of a crime. Typically it's, it's less than, a, it's a misdemeanor. Most people think of graffiti or tagging. And these things are just as important because really hate incidents are indications that hate crimes can follow if they are left unchecked. So it's important for community members to remember that they should report any incident of hate or bias. That be graffiti, that be, be it intimidation, be it someone shouts at you, uh, you know, while you're walking down the street. All of those incidents should be reported because when they're not reported, people have the impression that mm, they don't care or the behavior is okay, or there's, there's no price to pay for it. And as I, as I mentioned, I think this is really important to note, if hate incidents go unchecked, hate crimes will follow. Um, as to perpetrators of, of hate crimes, there are a couple of different categories. Most people think that um, people who commit hate, hate crimes um, have a deep and abiding hate ideology. And that's just the smallest percentage of perpetrators who commit hate crimes. And I'm talking about people who are, are, are dedicated to white supremacy, but uh, really believe and embrace that hate ideology. Um, your Klan members, your neo-Nazis, your committed haters, small percentage of the people who actually commit hate crimes. So another group on the other end who are known as thrill seekers, people that take advantage of the vulnerabilities of certain segments of the population. And they may or may not have actual hate or animus, but have some idea based on what's happening in society that this particular group of people is vulnerable to attack. And this happens most frequently when there's um, increased and heated rhetoric that targets that group of people. Uh, a, an example that comes to mind are people and members of the LGBTQ community, and they may have an area, typically in a larger city, there's a, there's a queer area where, where folks hang out. Thrill seekers are known to go to those areas and harass and attack people. So that would be your thrill seekers. Then there's a group in the middle, people who um, blame others for their plight. And that is the situation, primarily the situation that we find ourselves in today. If we have more time to talk about white nationalism and what, what animates them is this feeling that they're being displaced. Typically it's someone, you know, they want to blame another group for losing their job. They want to blame another group for um, their economic situation. So those are, that's a, that's a third group of, of hate crime perpetrators. And then victims typically, um, and I'll, I'll mention this again in the, the hate crime statistics report, the highest number of, um, or the most numerous victims are black folks and typically Jewish folks. The, um, the group, the bias cases that, that um, target people because of race or ethnicity are typically the most numerous. If it's a bias um, case related to religion, it's typically anti-Jewish. So let me, let me give you a little background on the Hate Crimes Statistic Act of 1990 as was referenced earlier. The FBI is required to compile hate crime data from approximately 18,000 federal, state, university, city, and tribal law enforcement authorities. And they're required to publish an annual report. This report provides data on a full range of hate crimes, race and ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, 
disability, gender, and gender identity. This data is aggregated by states, cities, counties, colleges, and universities. The FBI includes data from all police agencies that either one, and this is important, that either report one or more hate crimes or affirmatively report zero hate crimes. Agencies that do not report any hate crime data are not listed. And they're not included in the report at all. And this is very important. Though clearly incomplete, the FBI report is the most important, most comprehensive national snap snapshot of hate violence in, the, in, in America today. And since the FBI has, has integrated hate crime reporting into their overall uniform crime reporting system, the report can be compared to other crime data and used to analyze national trends. So to the extent that states and cities are reporting uh, credible hate crime data, the report provides a measure of accountability for states and cities, and it offers us a revealing look into their ability and readiness to address hate crimes. Three important facts I want the audience to keep in mind. Reporting hate crime data to the FBI is voluntary, and that is a problem. They are not mandated to report hate crimes. The entire system of crime reporting is voluntary. Murders, rapes, kidnapping, robberies, all of this information is voluntarily reported to, to the FBI. The FBI hate crimes report is exclusively on crimes, not arrests, not prosecution, just the facts as they appear at the scene of the crime. This is the reason that, that even the four states that don't have hate crime laws like Arkansas, Indiana, South Carolina, and Wyoming report hate crime data to the FBI. Lastly, the numbers do not speak for themselves. On average, 20 hate crimes occurred every day in America in 2019, 20. It's one every 75 minutes or so. The impact of these crimes on communities can never be reduced to mere numbers. Behind each and every one of this 7,314 incidents is a victim of violence, intimidation, or vandalism, targeted for no other reason than their race, religion, national origin, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So the report for 2019, they're always looking a year back, was a 3% increase over 2018. 51 hate crime murders, including the 22 people killed at the Walmart in El Paso. And as I mentioned, every year since 1991, race-based hate crimes were the most numerous, making up 3,983 3, of the total. And the vast majority of those race-based hate crimes were directed at Black people. Anti-Latinx, anti-Hispanic hate crimes increased for the fourth straight year. To 527. That's a 9% increase and the highest recorded since 2010. Religious based crimes were the second most numerous with 953 of the 1521 hate crimes directed, oh, I'm sorry, with 953 of those 1,521 reported religious based hate crimes directed towards Jews and Jewish institutions. That too is a 14% increase and the highest reported since 2008. We have hate crimes um, based on sexual orientation more than up, up by 16%. 198 crimes were directed against people and property on the basis of gender identity and 18% increase. Hate crimes came, to, came from 15,000 law enforcement agencies which was down from 16,000 um, in the earlier year. So lastly, I just want to point out a couple of statistics from um, Utah and Salt Lake City in particular. Salt Lake City reported one hate crime in 2019, the fifth largest city in the US that reported exactly one hate crime. Utah overall reported 18 hate crimes in 2019. 18 for the whole state for the whole year. 
And by comparison, surrounding states, states that surround you, Colorado reported 210, Idaho reported 24, Wyoming five, Nevada 44, and Arizona 209. So I want us to think about those numbers and remember that each of those numbers um, represents a victim of a bias related crime. And as one of the speakers said um, in the beginning, that people are attacked because of who they are. And hate crimes do have a rippling effect on others across the community because people are targeted be for, because of who they are. People who share those characteristics right, just rightfully have some fear and anxiety that they're going to be next. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak about this important topic this evening. Leisha, thank you so much uh, for those insights. Uh, very, very chilling. I mean, you know, one of the key points there that uh, reporting is down and yet somehow still hate crimes are up. And I think that just gives only a little bit of a peek of an insight then into the challenges that we're facing here. Our next panelist is going to be Brenda Castillo from the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Brenda, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Alejandro. It's such a pleasure to be here in collaboration with all of you. Absolutely. Now, um, the National Hispanic Media Coalition is certainly a remarkable organization, one that I first learned about almost 15 years ago. Um, and uh, not just for its representation of Latinx communities, um, but also for the work that it's done in terms of documenting and combating hate and, and stereotypes, <clears throat> pardon me, in mass media, among other things that it does. Um, and one of the things that I first learned about the organization um, was uh, an excellent um, uh, series of studies that they did in partnership with uh, UCLA's uh, Center for Chicano Studies, looking at hate speech on commercial talk radio. And let me just preface this for a moment here by saying that the, the research findings spoke to me personally as mm -hmm. someone who um, identifies by faith as a Muslim, by ethnicity uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, Latinx, and even by ancestry as Jewish. My father's Jewish, right? I've got a Catholic mother and you know a Jewish father. And yeah, so we've got all three religions in the family. We're mm -hmm. sort of a multicultural background and everything. And, and one of the things that I just found to be really compelling about this report was sort of the substantial overlap between anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant and racist dog whistle rhetoric that was identified in the study by several of these networks. And in line with, with again, tonight's event about raising awareness and understanding and the mission of, of the National Hispanic Media Coalition, can you help me with, a, with, with a, and, and all of us here tonight with a few things. Um, can you tell us more about how the media, broadly defined, um, has been helpful or hurtful in addressing uh, questions of hate and hate crimes, how they're covered in the media. Um, what are some of the most pressing issues that you've seen in your position uh, and your professional career when it comes to combating stereotyping in the mass media? How has this impacted other Latinx communities? And, you know, in your work uh, and role uh, in, the, in advocacy, you know, has your, your, uh, your work uh, on behalf of Latinx communities also had other important cascading effects for other folks, say, I don't know, Muslims, for example, not that I'm asking as an interested party, obviously. So what do you think? What are your thoughts? Listen, at the National Hispanic Media Coalition, we focus on all forms of media because it is one of the most influential and powerful institutions that exist. How we are perceived by the media is how we are treated. So for example, let's go back to 2016 when Trump was running for office. He began his campaign with hate speech, calling Mexicans criminals and rapists. The media of course covered Trump's racist remarks and social media repeated the phrase over and over and over again. Trump was invited to several popular late night shows like Jimmy Fallon, SNL, they treated Trump like he was a good guy, that it was okay for him to make these racist remarks. When you put, when you put Trump on shows like that, you humanize him, which in turn humanizes his hate. 
it makes it seem that it was socially acceptable. So since 2016, reports of hate crimes against Latinos increased. And this is according, even according to this month's FBI report, anti-Hispanic hate crimes rose nearly 9% from 2018 to 2019. You know, there in Salt Lake City, 2018, a young man, you know, was hurt. A man with a metal bar attacked a young teenager, Luis Lopez, and just prior to the attack said, I'm here to kill a Mexican. This young teenager's cheekbone was shattered and his eye socket collapsed. And the Lopez family, his parents blamed the motivation of the slurs on President Donald Trump. Just last month here in San Bernardino, California, a mother of four children, Marlon Munoz, who was making a living as a street vendor, uh, was plowed down by an SUV. It was a hit and run. And according to the police, the driver slowed down in front of Marlon's fruit stand and stepped on the gas, intentionally running her over. Marlon's family feels the assault was racially motivated and that he should be charged with a hate crime. And then there was the most deadliest attack on Latinx modern American history that took place August 2019, when a white supremacist drove more than 600 miles to El Paso, Texas, and massacred people claiming that he was going to take care of the Hispanic invasion. 23 dead, 23 injured. And this is what you call domestic terrorism. Trump had taken out more than 2,000 ads on Facebook and talked about the alien invasion. Mm -hmm. And he, in, on his manifesto, he mentioned he was going to take care of the Hispanic invasion. Hate speech leads to hate crimes. When the president of the United States does not denounce white supremacy on the networks and instead encourages hate, white supremacists are given the white, the green light to conduct violent crimes against not only Latinx, people of color, LGBTQ plus community because of their religion, all marginalized communities. Racism, discrimination and hate is at its all time high and media, you know, fuels it, especially on social media. Social media allows extremists and white supremacists to organize and plan, plan their hate crimes. Um, what happened in Kenosha, there was a Facebook invite, you know, that people were invited to go down and, and pick up their arms. And uh, as of the beginning of this week, they did take that um, invite down, but they still have it up in Spanish. So on the other side, media has brought us together though and giving us a tool to collaborate and expose, you know, police brutality among many other things. So to answer your question, Alejandro, media has been both helpful and hurtful in addressing hate and hate crimes. But um, for us at NHMC, we have been working very hard on online hate because that's where it seems to be fueling. Uh, we you know, continually work with Facebook and, you know, let them know when these posts are up. I mean, so a lot of them are in Spanish. Um, they're meant to divide our people. I don't know where they're coming from. If some are probably from the United States, some are probably from other countries. Um, Twitter, um, we've been working with Twitter, and I don't know if you guys knew this, but um, David Duke still had an account on Twitter. And this year, finally, Twitter changed their policy, and within three days after changing their policy, he broke it, and his account was closed this year. So um, that was a victory for us. We believe in collaboration and uh, with ADL, NAACP, Color of Change, Free Press, LULAC and other organizations, we have Stop Hate for Profit campaign. That's against Facebook. And we also work in collaboration with many other organizations. So that's why I'm so glad to see all of us here together. You mentioned what are some of the most pressing issues you have seen in regards to combating stereotyping. Well, how we perceive is how we're treated. If you see Latinos portrayed as criminals, drug lords, maids, gardeners, and all that, and that is all that you see on entertainment, that is not fair representation of who we are. Latinos 
come from all the four races. We're Afro-Latinos, we're Indigenous Latinos, we're Asian Latinos, European, Spanish Latinos, we're LGBTQ+, we're Muslim, we're Catholic, we're Jewish, we're many religions. We are not monolithic. So that is why it is so important that we write our own stories on television, streaming services, and film. At NHMC, we have a wonderful writers program and we have more than 180 alum. Nearly, it's been nearly 20 years now. And our writers are working for Netflix, Disney, HBO Max, Viacom, CBS, Pop TV, Amazon Prime, Nickelodeon, Sony Pictures, NBC Universal, Peacock, and many more. So it all begins with the writing and we need to be telling our own stories because we're so unique. Um, how does this impact Latinx communities? You know, these stereotypes, it dehumanizes us. And when you dehumanize, it really runs the risk of becoming something that is disrespected and feared and we're hated. And that is why you see our children right now in cages, separated by their parents, separate from their parents. You know, some are drugged, sexually abused, and then the women, we recently found out a couple of months ago that the women have been sterilized. And this is in 2020 here in the United States of America. And all this is being paid by us, the taxpayers. So uh, we have so much work ahead of us. Um, you asked the question about how we, you th we think advocacy for Latinx people, the work that we're doing affects and benefits other communities. Well, I believe the policy and media advocacy we do at NHMC all year round definitely benefits other POC and marginalized communities. Um, our work in Washington, DC, our policy work, we work to close the digital divide and that's another major problem, not only for, for Latinos, but for blacks and native Americans. We do not have access to internet, can't afford it. Some of our children do not have laptops. I think you saw that social media post where two young girls, I believe in a parking lot in Taco Bell trying to use the Wi-Fi there to do their homework. I worry about the digital divide and this coronavirus and how it has affect our communities because I don't think our children are getting a good education and I'm thinking long-term effects. So one human being, um, one human being the victim of hate is everyone's struggle. So in the days, months, years ahead of us, let's focus on the word united in the United States of America, because united we are stronger. Great, thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you very much for your insights there. Our next speaker is going to be Eric Ward from the Western State Center. Welcome and thank you for joining us. It's such a pleasure to see you and thanks for having me here today. Thank you, Eric. Now, Eric, you're at the helm of the Western State Center, which like the other organizations represented tonight, have, has done incredible work combating hate, including white nationalism and hate crimes. Now, in this vein, I think that members of the audience, uh, and I know at least speaking for myself, let me start there instead, would stand to benefit from two areas that the center has had significant impact on. Uh, and a few moments ago, uh, Brenda had talked about mass media, hate, hate crimes, stereotyping, and also talked a little bit also about social media. Uh, and there's been growing attention on social media. Um, you know, I think it's sort of an ubiquitous thing. Many of us use it all the time. Um, and as someone who um, has also dedicated his life to fighting white nationalism and hate, sort of in, 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 in a two-part set of questions here, can you please provide an overview of how extremists are using social media to spread messages of racism and anti-Semitism and what the center is doing with its coalition partners such as, NA, uh, as, such as the, His, the coalition and the Southern Poverty Law Center? What are you guys doing uh, to combat online hate um, and recruitment? And the other thing here, I just wanna take a step back because at the beginning of everything, you know, I wanted to also mention about symbolism of tonight and the present sort of moment that we're in historically. You know, almost 22 years ago uh, in neighboring Wyoming, there was a young man who was killed in a hate homicide because he was identified as gay. 
Now, Matthew Shepard, and of course, another individual who was also killed that same year, James Byrd, an African-American man, they had a hate crimes law that was passed in their name in 2009. Um, and so given Utah's recent adoption of hate crimes legislation, can you also sort of give us your assessment of how well hate crimes are being hand handled uh, out in the West? Um, and in particular, um, not just uh, in general uh, for all hate crimes, but also how might this be impacting LGBTQ plus communities and native communities in particular who may not always be at the forefront of some of these conversations? These are good questions. And, and the, this portion around um, you know, online hate violence and looking at the power of social media and how we respond to this, coupled with um, you know, what we saw at least for uh, the previous year reported was a um, almost a, a three times increase, I believe, in, in hate crime violence uh, in Utah. Let's first start with the social media and then we'll talk a little bit about the, the impact of, of hate crimes on, on the ground and its impact on some specific communities. Before we talk about social media, I think there's two important things that all of us should, should hold in mind. According to reporting in 2018, uh, somewhere near 57% of Americans uh, reported experiencing some type of hate rhetoric um, or interaction online on social media platforms or through email or text. Yeah, of that percentage, uh, 37% um, of that grouping expressed that the interaction was severe. That means it included threats, uh, direct threats of violence, uh, stalking, uh, or threats of assault or other forms of harassment. That's fairly significant, understanding that half of America um, has experienced some form of, of hate crime uh, or, or hate rhetoric online. That tells us one thing, that we're not talking about something in theory. We're not talking about something that is limited to the fringes of the internet. It is something that all of us experience. There has been a concerted effort for over a decade by, um, I think, significant civil rights organizations such as Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, our colleagues at the Hispanic Media Center and Anti-Defamation League and others uh, including Color of Change, who have been working in deep coalition uh, to address this. There are some things we should understand about this, that this is not an issue of free speech. This is not a push, right, to get government to censor, right, or to prevent rhetoric. What the push is about in understanding the proliferation of hate and disinformation on social media is about getting tech, tech companies, uh, particularly platforms like Facebook and others, to act like responsible citizens. What I mean by this is that this is not an issue of controlling speech. This is an issue of coming to terms with the fact that many social media platforms have profited off of hate on the internet. Why? because staying on media platforms is what drives avenue buy, revenue buys. And to get folks to stay on social media platforms means getting all of us to engage. And what algorithms figured out early on is that controversy keeps us engaged. Controversy or trolling gets us to respond. It gets us drawn into a conversation we draw our friends into that conversation, we spread the conversation around, and we find ourselves in an endless cycle. In truth, hate on social media spreads because it is deemed to be profitable. And that has been a problem. So it's not just that social media platforms are turning a blind eye to hatred. It is that many social media platforms have figured out that there is a business revenue model in the spreading of hatred. So for years, 
getting social media platforms to come to terms with their responsibility in stopping the proliferation of disinformation and hate was met with resistance, with strong resistance. In fact, Twitter is one of the models of a group that is a business that is actively responding to the distribution of hate on its network. As we have read in newspapers over the last months and years, Facebook has been held up as a model of individuals who have turned a blind eye to the impact of hate violence on our communities. We know that both white nationalists and those engaged in hate violence find their oxygen on social media, not because it's spread around everywhere, but because algorithms lift up these. We have all heard, right, the narrative that it only takes three clicks to find yourself within the world of white nationalism, conspiracism, and anti-Semitism. That is not because most people go looking for it. It is because, again, those algorithms drive us there. That is why organizations have come together in coalition to push for standards within business, right, that understand that we should not profit off of bigotry, we should not profit off of organized hate and the dehumanization of others. It is a serious conversation that needs more voices to weigh in, not just human rights organizations, but other businesses and cities and states. For you see, none of us are immune from the actualization and the mobilizing and the motivation of those who might later commit hate crimes. While certainly these companies aren't responsible for those hate crimes, that is left to the perpetrators themselves, it is important for us to understand that all of us become victims. When individuals are targeted because of their race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or national origin, it sends a message. It has a ripple effect across communities. Hate crimes are unique and that most of them are stranger crimes. Most crimes that happen in our communities occur between individuals who know one another. Because these are stranger crimes, it leaves not just the victim, but the entire community, anyone who perceives that they too could have been, the been that victim, to be paralyzed, isolated, and alienated in our community. That means they are less likely to participate in the civic life of the community and the economic life of the community. <clears throat> it means that individuals who feel vulnerable around hate violence are less likely to come out at night, attend public meetings, attend cultural events, to shop and to do things that give life to our communities. And what we know is that there is a direct causation between rhetoric online and what happens in terms of hate crime violence. We saw this during the presidential election campaigns and we've witnessed it over the last four years. It is a conjecture. Numerous studies have been produced over the last four years that support this argument that what public officials and others say online gets translated into physical violence in our communities. So the push around holding companies responsible for their algorithms is critically important. But I wanna talk about the victims as you asked. The victims of hate crimes are numerous. As Leisha pointed out earlier, the data is incomplete because there isn't mandatory reporting. That means many law enforcement agencies and security companies don't have to report statistics when it comes to hate crimes. This means we don't know the true impact but we see it each and every day. We hear it in the stories of people who shop in groups and we see it in the fear that people have of writing letters to the editor or giving public testimony in community meetings or in, in civic governmental meetings. We should understand though, that within the, hate crime, the world of hate crimes, that there are disproportionate victims. When it comes to race, African-Americans tend to be significant victims of hate crimes and hate violence. 
far outside of their percentage in the community. So too are Jews when it comes to religious forms of hate violence. And so is it with Native Americans who are least likely to report hate crimes when they occur. Hate crimes strip people of their humanity. It injects fear and suspicion into our communities. And holding these social media companies accountable is critically important. I think that local and state governments should be doing accounting of what hate crimes and hate organizing cost them each and every day, not just in budgetary manners, but in economy loss. And I believe that local and state government should then push social media to either compensate them for the loss or to address their systems of bias that allow hate rhetoric to flourish. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, and on that powerful note, again, I want to thank not only Eric, but all of our panelists for opening uh, for their opening thoughts. Um, I wanna now switch gears to our Q&A. And again, as a reminder to everyone, for those who are interested in, you may submit questions uh, online through the Q&A function uh, of the webinar and also on Facebook for, for those who are watching. Um, let me start with uh, one question that we had gotten right off the bat, and I'll open it actually up to all the, uh, the panelists here for a moment. Um, and that is, um, someone had asked, why um, focus on hate rather than love uh, as sort of the understanding uh, and, and the, the impetus for today's discussion? Yeah. So love is important, right? And, and this is Eric Ward and, and, and love wins. Uh, we, should, we should remember though, the, the ability to, to love and, and love freely comes from a place of, of safety, right? And for uh, most people of color and, and other minorities in this country, they don't have that space of safety. What they are feeling is fear. And while we need to understand that we cannot give up on anyone, including those who promote bigotry, right? Neither can we allow our communities to be created in a way that says to vulnerable communities that they must suffer those indignities and violence until the rest of the community finds their love path, right? So that's why we talk about hate. We talk about hate because hate is a direct attack on democratic practice. It silos and isolates people. It makes them feel that they are out of community and people out of community are less likely to love that community. Alicia, Brenda. Brenda. Well, we have to talk about hate because there's still people out there that don't believe the Holocaust mm -hmm. occurred. There's still people out there that don't believe the coronavirus is true. Of course, we have to talk about hate, but talking about hate doesn't take away from love. Love is the most powerful thing. And that's why I'm a true believer in the human being. And, and that is what love is what brought us here together today. And, and we're conversing and we're figuring out these problems together. Thank you, Elsa. I would just add that for me, it's important to talk about hate and the ugliness and the, the reality of people's everyday situation. For people from impacted communities, the, the hate crime report is a, a validation of what we experience every day, whether or not we were directly impacted by the hate crimes, it validates that it's there. So it's another way that, uh, that people from impacted communities, people of color, BIPOC members, immigrants, queer people, what the, the systemic oppression that we experience every day is made manifest in the hate crime statistics report. And so it's an opportunity for, for us to say, this is happening to our community. Do you care? Do you love us? Are we a member of the community? So sometimes to get to that place of love, we have to look at how, as Eric said, how we're othered and held outside of that circle of love. Fantastic, thank you. We have a question from Sarah. Um, um, I would like to hear a panelist respond to this notion 
Social media is a tool for communication like any other, telephone, letters, etc. It is neither positive nor negative and can be used equally by hateful groups as well as by hateful groups. Hate groups and community organizations predate social media. Thoughts? Yeah, I, so this is Eric again. I, I think it's important to remember the idea that social media is an equal neutral platform is simply not true, right? Um, I wish it were uh, a neutral platform, um, but the algorithms are biased. Um, the algorithms are driven um, by the idea that controversy is more profitable, right? That, that, is, an un, that is not an unbiased system. Uh, in addition, we know that in the way that racial bias works in society, right, that people of color are more likely to be penalized, right, um, for expressing bigoted remarks, right, than white people on the internet. And we, that I am not making that up, right? These are studies that are easily verified just by Googling, right? Um, Algorithms are not neutral. Algorithms are biased because they come into our society. And the way that algorithms have been utilized, they have been used in a way that put people of color at risk each and every day. The only way that these algorithms look unbiased is if we happen to be privileged enough not to be in those vulnerable communities. But I see it each and every day, and I've watched it for over 10 years. I've seen social change activists, right, uh, including myself, right? Western State Center has had the majority of its ads, right, rejected on Facebook at the same time that folks like David Duke and others were posting ads left and right. That is a bias in the algorithms. And we have to understand that that bias exists and it puts all of us at risk. It puts our democracy at risk. Alicia, Brenda. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I know that I, well, Brenda will have much to say um, as, as she did in her comments about you know, the power of media. I wanna step back a second and talk about its power to um, accelerate radicalization. And that is a, that's one of the primary concerns at the Southern Poverty Law Center today is that, yeah, hate groups did, did predate social media. And it, it used to be that you had to go to a meeting or you get a newsletter or be attached to some group to pick up on and come to believe this hateful ideology. Now, through the power of, of social media, these, this rhetoric, this disinformation, um, this, the, the, uh, the incorrect information with respect to, to racial or white genocide or white displacement can, can, can spread like wildfire and radicalize young people. And so, so that's, that's my primary concern right now. It's, it, it's the power to radicalize people. We found that in this time of COVID, as young people are spending more and more time online, that they're becoming um, more radicalized because they're exposed to um, hateful messages and hateful rhetoric and hate ideology that will pull them in. It's easier to go down the rabbit hole of social media than it is for someone to go to the library and do research on their own to find, to, to develop hateful, hateful um, beliefs themselves. So it, it's an accelerant. And so for, for no other reason, it needs to be guarded because young people are, are and adults but I'm concerned about young people at this point are, are, are susceptible to it. Great, thank you. And Brenda? Yeah, just to add, um, listen, online platforms need to be made accountable. And just like I spoke about writing and fair representation and we need to write our own stories, well, they have a big employment discrimination um, problem there. Mm -hmm. They do not have people of color in C-suite positions on their board of directors. The majority of these companies are located in Northern California where Latinos are more than 41% of the population. And believe me, we are not in those C-suite positions and we're not on the board. 
And Mark Zuckerberg um, is the CEO and president, runs that company. He has the majority of the stock and he chairs the board. So you can't even complain to the board about Mark Zuckerberg because he is the board. And there's no, there's no Latinos on that board or, you know, uh, they have to reflect America. And as soon as we start putting people in those positions, I think we're gonna be seeing change on those online platforms. Great, Brenda, I actually have a, a question directed to you. Um, this is from uh, Mitchell Zavallos, uh, um, who's from Telemundo, Utah. His question is as follows. Um, how do you see the statistics of hate crimes in Salt Lake City? And, uh, and how has that affected uh, the Latinx community during uh, the last four years? Uh, apologize here. And. Um, what is the most significant complaint uh, you have received? And he asks, um, if you can answer in Spanish, I would appreciate it. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I'm not fluent in Spanish. So um, crimes in Utah. Um, I did mention the young teenager, Lopez, and I haven't done enough research to see all the hate against uh, Latinos, but I'm sure Telemundo is doing a good job in covering them. Um, I know that in Utah, there also has been some hate crime towards the LGBTQ plus community. And I think this is, uh, you guys are headed in the right direction and the mayor and all of you are headed in the right direction. And maybe there's a way for, to engage Telemundo in finding solutions there in Utah because you do have a high percentage of Latinos living there. And I don't know what the percentages of Spanish speaking Latinos that are living there in Utah, but um, it would be nice for him to get involved and start some kind of partnership there in Utah. I would like to see that. Maybe I can facilitate that with all of you. That would be, that would certainly be, you know, a great follow on to this, you know, and, and you mentioned before, um, you know, heading in the right direction. And there's a question actually from, uh, 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 from an individual uh, online, and this is to all the panelists here, but uh, the question is asking, are there some communities that you find that are, um, that are success stories in terms of uh, actively reducing hate crimes or even is that, does that even include other countries? Um, you know, and um, uh, what have been some ways in which communities have pushed back um, uh, against uh, hate and hate crimes, um, whether here in the United States or around the world at all levels of society from, you know, the, the, uh, from, you know, everyday citizens up to the, to the highest echelons of power? This is a question to all of the panelists. The, the example that always comes to me, and I'm sure that there are more, but Montana's not, no not in our town campaign. You may recall it was years ago and it's still a great and fine model to follow. Um, a Jewish family was, was attacked, right? Or intimidated, I can't, can't remember the facts of the case now, but everyone in the town put menorahs up in pictures of menorahs up in their window. And they said they would not have hate, they would not experience hate in their town. And, and this was this um, strategy this community action was taken again more recently. The Southern Poverty Law Center brought a lawsuit against a neo-Nazi, Andrew Anglin, who was intimidating a Jewish family, Tanya Gersh, in, um, in uh, Whitefish, Montana. And that community came together across faith, across all you know, aspects of diversity to say that they would not, that they, they stood with the Gersh family and hate would not be, um, uh, permitted in their town. So I think it's a matter of, it, 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 there's no kind of magic formula. It is just standing up for one another. It is taking a stand against hate. It is saying that, no, that we will not allow this in our space and in our community. And that requires the action of each community member. I would also like to point out that this is something that can and should be done um, in individual situations. When you're thinking, when you're, when you're uh, a bystander, some people refer to it as, as being an upstander. The, the examples that Brenda gave, and, and there's so many more um, vile attacks against Latinx people. We saw the videos of people, be, women being harassed in stores for speaking Spanish 
things happen all around us all the time where we have an opportunity to say, no, that is not, I will not allow it. And so I think the more we push back and the responsibility is on the individuals as it is on, as much as it is on um, city leaders to say that, that we will not allow it. Start in your family, work with, within your own circle. Let people know that you don't abide by, um, um, you know, racial animus, anti-LGBT, anti-Semitic, you just don't abide by it. And, and that's a place I think that we, each of us can and should start. But we don't even wanna stand up to our family. Lucia, you brought it up. I mean, that is so important. It starts at home mm -hmm. and colorism does exist in our communities. And these are hard conversations that we must have. And um, I think we need to include our children so we can stop the hate. Isha, I actually want to, uh, uh, that's, that's what your remarks, insightful remarks, they're actually a great segue to a question from Rob Mulman, um, who's the executive director of Utah Pride. And again, this is, uh, I think, to all of the panelists here. But um, uh, uh, Mr. Mulman, um, uh, using uh, he, him pronouns, um, uh, starts off by saying, one of the most visible representations of hate is the current uh, uh, state of 300 plus um, uh, uh, transgender flags outside our wonderful mayor's office in the city uh, and county building in Salt Lake City today, representing the more than 300 transgender and disproportionately trans women of color who have been killed this year alone. I'll just take a moment to just emphasize that again, 300, okay. Tomorrow, the LGBTQ plus community will be mourning the lives on the annual, these lives on the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance. Um, and so uh, Mr. Moolman then I think transitions this then to a broader question in terms of, again, this issue of, of speaking out, standing up. How do we convince more leaders that silence is consent when it comes to issues of hate or radicalization? And you know, what are additional things um, that can be done in terms of practical steps for, you know, tr continuing to try and, and, and move the needle. And, 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 and I would imagine that this, this question comes in the context, again, of the momentum that has, um, you know, been built up in a state like Utah, which is admittedly somewhat of a latecomer to the, you know, adopting a state level hate crimes, but they are moving in the right direction. So how do we keep that momentum going and how do we break the silence uh, 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 as consent. How do we break that, that everyone? We show up, we continue to show up. Tomorrow is trans day, trans, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Show up somewhere. Go, there, there will, there'll be a vigil, one or two in the city. Show up, get a flag, write it, post it on, put it on your Facebook page. Engage in the remembrance yourself. Again, I think that city leaders follow the the lead of the community members, right? We don't need you don't need city government to say, okay, we're 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 honoring you know transgender community today. Let us as citizens honor all members of our community. Let's find a way to do that. So I I think that um, when you were talking about uh, city leaders, I thought of I thought of Trump city leaders elected officials. I thought of the White House, I, and I'm a queer, a queer identified woman myself. And so I remember when the White House, when, when Obama was there and the White House was lit up with the rainbow flag. And oh my gosh, it was the most beautiful thing. So simple acts like that, acknowledging people and their humanity, acknowledging people and who they are, flying a Black Lives Matter flag, um, uh, speaking up against the, the um, separation of families, speaking up to, 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 to um, call out ICE, speaking up when you're not, the, you're not the victim and it has absolutely nothing to do with you is, the, is one of the most powerful things that I think an individual can do. And those, there are examples all around us. I, I shared some of the hate crime statistics. It touches, it touches every, every, every human being. Sadly, we see this happen a lot. We come together after a tragic event has occurred um, similarly to kind of how social media, when, when a tragic act happens, then they're all about taking down people's um, uh, profiles. But we don't have to and shouldn't wait for that. We should stand in solidarity with our Jewish brothers and sisters every day. We should stand in solidarity with Muslims. You know, I mean, again, I'm just repeating myself, but 
there are things that we can do and there are celebrations that that happen all of the time join a community support the people within your community you know i shared the story of the young 28 year old um, that was just trying to make a living on the corner with her little umbrella and stand selling fruit and she was the victim of hate crime that's i came to the office a day later and it just bothered me so much that i picked up the phone and i called the san bernardino sheriff department pick up the phone right anybody can do that i kept on calling until i finally found the investigator and i asked him why is it that you're not I mean, they moved the 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 from an assault with a deadly weapon to attempted murder, but they didn't have the hate crime. Put on. So I asked him, why aren't you charging him with a hate crime? He says, well, we don't have the evidence. And, you know, um, and I said, well, you need to, you know, take control of his Mac, his phone, and you're going to find a history of hate. Um, I he you know we had a human to human conversation but i think it did affect him and he says believe me my wife told me she had four children and that i need to stay on top of this so you don't have to be latinx you don't have to be an immigrant to stand up for somebody else pick up the phone and ask questions mm -hmm. and i would just say really yeah look i I think we have to understand a, a, a couple of things, right? We can't just look at, at hate violence and, and hate crimes as kind of a, uh, um, as just impacting the, the victim, right? It really is uh, an assault on the community. And in addressing hate crime violence, right? It's really critically important, right? And we'll, we'll get into some lessons. And I say this has you know, a person who has been a victim of hate crimes. I say this as a person who has intervened in hate crimes. I say it as a person who has worked with their community, right, to respond to climates of hate. The first thing that has to happen in a community is that elected officials have to set the standard, right? Not just once a year, right? There has to be constant communication to the community that hate crimes and hate violence will not be tolerated. You know, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 here in the Pacific Northwest and mountain states regions, hate crimes skyrocketed, right? Not only against American Muslims, but those who are perceived to be American Muslims, such as Latinos, Sikhs, right? And also against the Jewish community. There were at least in the country, three murders that occurred over the first three days following 9-11, right? I was working in Seattle, Washington, I was working in this region, and I can tell you hate crimes were skyrocketing. And then all of a sudden they dropped off at one point. And that point was a direct correlation, right? to when John Ashcroft, who was the attorney general at the time, and George Bush, the president, took to the airwaves and said, hate crimes against Muslims will absolutely not be tolerated in this society. Hate crimes dropped off immediately. So having elected officials speak up is critically important. Having opportunities for community leaders and others to engage in what it means to be to do bystander intervention, right? To de-escalate situations that can lead to hate crimes is also critically important. So is reporting. I want to also argue that the hate crimes and the violence targeting the transgender community right, is horrifying in our country. But we should remember that those numbers have likely always been that high, right? The difference is now that we have an empowered community, right, that is no longer sitting in silence. So we are seeing the level of violence in front of us for the first time, creating that space for people to be able to share their stories of hate crimes and hate violence is also critically important. I liken that back to the, to the era 
right, where we were doing education, trying to counter rape culture in this country. One of the key pieces was having people come forward and tell their stories. And we don't do that. We leave hate crimes in the shadow. The last really quickly is this. We have an over-focus on criminalization of hate crimes rather than an economic cost to being engaged in hate crimes. We live in a society, right? Whether you like it or not, right? That places a high value on the dollar. Making people pay the price of engaging in hate violence through economic costs, right? Through civil suits and civil trials rather than relying on crime, I think has helped to lessen, right? Hate crimes and environments. So there are things that we can do, right? That are very practical, very measurable. In Eugene, Oregon, which I believe has one of the best reporting models on hate crimes, every year when the data comes out, right? We see articles across the country that say Eugene, Oregon has the highest hate crimes in the nation, right? It's not that Eugene, Oregon and Lane County have the highest hate crimes in the nation. It's that they have the best reporting system in the nation. So they understand the problem and are able to create pathways of intervention. So I'll tell you, the best states that are doing the best work on hate crimes actually see the number of hate crimes in their data increase because they're actually capturing those stories and it allows them then to do something mm -hmm. about it. Well, so thank you very much uh, for that, for that, Eric and, and Brenda and Leisha. Um, you know, on the notion of economic sanctions for a moment here as well, um, there was a person who asked a question um, on Facebook, are there any mechanisms for class action lawsuits against hate actors and groups? So let me just start with you, Eric, and then also to over to Leisha and, and Brenda as well. But since you mentioned economic sanctions and other sort of, you know, uh, uh, mechanisms for, um, for seeking justice, let me turn the question over to you for a moment on that and see, because I know for sure, I'm sure Leisha has quite a bit as well from SPLC to answer on that, but Eric? Absolutely. When, when state AGs, right, have taken uh, individuals and uh, organizations to court and held them accountable, right, for the violent actions, uh, assaults, murders, bombing, uh, it certainly has had an effect. Um, so have private entities or, or, or nonprofits at Southern Poverty Law Center, right, here in our region of the country, Southern Poverty Law Center was involved in two critical cases that uh, were critical, right, for the rest of us in turning the tide against hate in our region. The murder of Mulligator Sarah, the beating and murder of Mulligator Sarah, an Ethiopian immigrant on the streets of Portland in 1988, right, uh, uh, resulted in a civil suit against white airing resistance, right, which broke the back of one of the most radical and violent uh, neo-Nazi organizations in America. Then in the early 2000s, uh, late 90, 90s, early 2000s, the Southern Poverty Law Center suit against the Aryan Nations in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, went a long way to disrupting white nationalist organizing, particularly illegal violence, right, in our region uh, for nearly two decades. But look, nonprofits, you know, Southern Poverty Law Center, Western State Center, we're, we, we're not without resources. But we are not government, right? We are not governance. And we cannot rely on the civil on civil society, right? The nonprofit portion of civil society to address these issues alone. We need businesses, we need government, we need religious institutions to step up, right? And to lean into this fight. I will tell you, hate crimes impact your community in ways that you do not understand. Right, the economic cost of bigotry, right, and violence is significant. Citigroup itself just recently did a study that showed that racial inequality, right, in our economy will cost the United States $5 trillion over the next five years. So we have to stop thinking about this as if we are coming to the aid of victims. 
This is about being responsible leaders, right? Within our own communities and ensuring that our communities have the best opportunities, right? To take advantage, right? Of social conditions, economic conditions that provide opportunity for everyone and hate crimes, right? Cut that in significant ways. So I just say, government needs to step up. It needs to set the example. It needs to reshape law enforcement so that it understands that responding to hate crimes is a priority, is the priority. That is how we begin to help shape education, opening up space for civil suits to be able to be filed, removing some of the bureaucracy. And I'll just end it this way. Just um, before um, uh, quarantine in March, right, before the arrival of the COVID quarantine, there was a bias crime that took place right outside my house, mm -hmm. right? I actually had to physically intervene to prevent violence against two folks with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. I had to call 911 right? 911 told me to go inside because why? They were afraid that I would actually get profiled by the very folks I was calling for help, which were law enforcement, right? So I could not intervene a second time as, this vic as the perpetrator started to chase the two folks with disabilities down the street with a metal pipe. I saw law enforcement, but 30 minutes later, the person who committed the hate crime was sitting right across the street from my house. Nothing had been done, right? When we have government that doesn't take hate crimes seriously, we can't be surprised when people choose it as a way of trying to solve their problems. And so we have to set the standard. We have to draw the moral barrier against hate. Great, Eric. And I'm sorry to do this. We have so many questions. So we've got literally two minutes left. Uh, Brenda or Alicia, does either of you want to answer this? Because uh, if not, then I'm just going to uh, do a quick thing. Okay, so. Uh, what is that though? Because yeah. hate and violence against women also get the, the need to get the same respect from law enforcement. That has been a big issue for the longest time. And um, we haven't actually spoken about women and the hate that goes online about women. And, you know, within films, I can tell you that the Latinas are the most sexualized characters in film. So again, what, how we're perceived women in film and media is how we are treated in real life. Great, so I'm gonna bundle two questions uh, together here um, because we've had a ton of questions here and the challenge, this has been great. Thank you all uh, members of the audience and the panelists as well. This is a wonderful challenge to have which is to try and answer as many questions as possible. So in, in a Hail Mary here, uh, I'm just gonna bundle two questions together um, which are uh, one um, which is, um, what can we do to get proper education in schools uh, to, to help our young uh, next generation uh, understand and combat hate? And then the second question, and I'm gonna try and tie this together is, is what we've seen in terms of hate and hate crime something that has always, uh, uh, always existed? Um, with respect to the outgoing ad administration, it, have they been creating more hate? Or is this something that they ha that has always just been sort of under the surface and just been brought uh, brought to the forefront, which then may necessitate um, additional education. So could each of you answer this in, uh, uh, in 30 seconds or less if you want to, but just 30 seconds. Let me start. Has the Trump administration ignited hate? Absolutely. He has dehumanized Latinos, Blacks, gay, people with disability. He's poked fun at veterans. So absolutely, he has fueled hate in America. Absolutely, without a doubt. And in regards to education, I think we, we need to change our history books, our social, our social studies. They're lying. They're not telling the truth of the United States of America and our history and how we've treated our people. Um, everything from the indigenous to, you know, 
all the communities. So that's my 30 seconds. Great, thank you. Leisha? I, I agree, I would add to that. And so one of the things that the incoming administration can do is immediately overturn the current president's executive order um, banning people from talking about race and racial, racial oppression, right? We cannot um, hope to educate young people um, to prepare them to be participants in a diverse democracy without telling them the truth about what's happening. As we've experienced this period of racial reckoning over the last few months, it's ridiculous and counterproductive that such an executive order would be issued. Right at the time when people are seen prepared, most prepared to want to engage in conversations about systemic racism, about um, xenophobia, about anti-Black racism, He's saying that we can't do it. So, so that needs to be done. Of course, the Department of Education needs to be given more resources so that they can talk about true history, that, that, that the textbooks that we use need to, to be taken away from, and that's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. Texas and a couple of states decide all of the textbook, what the textbooks our students use, and those are the ones that are that are uh, spreading, continue to spread mis misinformation that people, Africans who were enslaved were not really slaves. And, you know, no mention of, of um, the, the Becerra movement didn't happen, you know, ridiculousness like that. So, so that's one thing. And two, what needs to happen is that funding needs to be increased and training required for all law enforcement agencies across the country to one, recognize, acknowledge, and accept that hate crimes and hate incidents are real that they're given the tools and the training to carry out investigations and that they, they cause this will help to improve police community relations. That's key. Eric um, spoke to that a little bit about the, the underreporting from victims. Sorry. Yes. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Okay. Got, got, the, got the last word there, Eric. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah. Look, I want to thank everyone, and I, I just want folks to stand up for each other. If I could say one thing, right, it would be, right, that this administration, the incoming administration, the president-elect, um, actually mandate mandatory reporting of hate crimes in this country and actually put forward the resources, right, to, to all law enforcement infrastructure in, in which to, to do so. We just have no understanding of the level of hate crime violence in this country. And that's really dangerous in this period. Thank you very much. And on that note then, uh, let me just again thank all the panelists, Eric, Leisha, Brenda, thank you all very, very much here. Before I, uh, we close out, just a couple of quick thoughts. Again, thanking the panelists, thanking you, the members of the audience as well for being here tonight. We hope that this has been a robust discussion and one that will help to sort of raise our awareness and deepen our understanding of the issues. Uh, equally important, we all hope that this will continue to keep the momentum going, make what our modest contribution uh, to the momentum for fighting hate, hate crimes, and of course, yes, spreading love and inclusion and tolerance as well, um, including in the state of Utah. And uh, finally, before handing it back over to Jay, I just wanna thank the Salt Lake City government, uh, the Salt Lake City County government, Salt Lake County government, the Salt Lake City library for all of their moral, logistical and technical support. The same goes for the various local civil society uh, 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 partners uh, and organizers of, of tonight's event. And of course as well, uh, I, can't, I can't go any further without also mentioning Jay Jacobson as well. Um, you know, and, and just really quickly, Jay, I think this all reminds me of a verse that um, is in the Quran, but also uh, in the Jewish tradition as well, which is that, you know, if we are to uh, save the life of one human being, it is as though we're saving the life of all of humanity. Um, and that's not just something that is peculiar to any particular religious tradition, but to anyone with any humanistic spirit out there. And so on that note, then, I just want to say again, thank you all very much. Jay, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank all of you on the panel tonight. And I share Alejandro's thanks to the wonderful people at the city and the library who really helped prepare us all for this event and made it run so well. Um, I, I really want to say that I heard the phrase speak up and stand up probably five times tonight. 
And I think that's the answer to the question that's on many people's mind, which is what can I do? So I wanted to let you all know that uh, at the Federation, we actually have a booklet called Speak Up and Stand Up, and it's free. But we'll give it to you at a discount because the 2019 statistics are now out and our booklet is 2018. It has data on hate crimes in the U.S. and in Utah. And if you contact our federation at shalomutah.org, we'll be glad to send you that booklet. A couple other loose ends or ends to, to tie up. Alejandro said at the beginning that this is a huge subject and can't possibly be addressed in a little over an hour. Our goals, however, were modest. They were for us to leave with greater awareness and understanding. I know I have, and I sense that it's possible that even the panelists uh, learn from each other tonight and from Alejandro and from your questions. So I think that we'd like to hear back from you. There's a survey link in the chat. If you copy it and paste it, you can take the survey. Tell us if, in fact, this increased your awareness and understanding, and particularly tell us if you'd like to learn more about this or be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. We have been told by the city and the library that we can do something again in January, more likely with leaders from our own community. So at that point, I think we can move from words to action. Uh, I'd like you all to know that uh, Mr. Muhlman that asked a question tonight is the head of the Pride Center, one of our partners against hate. The others you'd recognize are Jose Borjon, the Mexican consul for Utah. Uh, by the way, to the question that was challenging for Brenda, both Consul Borjon and I know about many, many more hate crimes and incidents to Hispanic individuals, especially kids in school, than are ever reported to the police. So I love the idea of Telemundo. I think the Consul would be interested in that. That was a great takeaway for tonight. For the Muslim community, Luna Banuri, who is in charge of the Muslim Civic League here, is again one of our partners and would be glad to work with you uh, against hate and to pre prevent hate. And finally, in the African American community, Franz Davis, uh, former pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church, is not only working with us, but serving on the mayor's uh, commission for equity, racial equity in policing. So lots of things are happening in the community. I hope we'll have an opportunity to see all of you that were our audience tonight again. And I could only hope we could be joined at some future point by some of our panelists and perhaps in person in Salt Lake City. We are so indebted to all of you uh, for what you've shared tonight. Thank you and good evening.